Morning, nurses. This is Kevin, and uh, we're on week two of cardiac uh, pharmacology. All right, let's get into it. All right, so we're talking about uh, cardiology, uh, cardiac medications. More specifically, it's one of the most tested uh, items on the NCLEX because there's the highest risk of cardiac medications. This doesn't mean that other medications are not important, but cardiac is the most prescribed medications and because of the most uh, uh, increased risk of uh, mortality with um, whether it's an MI or strokes or anything like that. So cardiac tends to be a high value um, testable item. So let's get right into it. This is week two. We're gonna have two weeks of this. We're gonna be breaking down chronic medications and acute medications, and we're gonna start talking a little bit more about the cards. Okay, recap cardiac medications. And as I mentioned earlier, everything will be uh, kind of repetition. And so as we start to build on this, uh, we'll, we'll get closer to the end. All right, so no chance quadru quadruple GI bleed. All right, so some big things about this. We talked about this um, last week, and these are all bleeding medications. And when you're looking at bleeding medications, um, these are high risk, right? So you're going to be checking your hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, with these medications. So if you have medications in the question, um, it's a, it's a, question about the medication, right? But if the medication is in the answers, it's generally a distractor. Um, so these medications are very important because there's a high risk of bleeding with all of these medications. And, you know, there are other medications that cause bleeding, but these tend to be the most, um, most uh, tested on. All right, so let's take them one at a time. So these medications all increase risk of bleeding. And we said that we monitor the H&H, &H, the hemoglobin and hematocrit. And we said that this, this fishbone right here is called the CBC. And that CBC is complete blood count. So the first column here is your WBC. Your second column is your hemoglobin and hematocrit. And then your last column is your platelets. And all these medications, all the, sorry, all these labs are labs that can kill your patient. So uh, specifically for bleeding, though, we're looking at the hemoglobin, and then we're looking at the platelets, okay? We're not going to get too much into the normal lab values. I just want you to be familiar with the terms, and kind of we'll move on from that later. All right, so when we're talking about Plavix, we're talking about it's antiplatelets. So Plavix is the uh, trade name. And clopidogrel is the uh, generic name. So you'll probably see clopidogrel in your top 100. And Plavix is mainly for, um, given for stents. And what a stent is, a stent is um, on the heart, there is um, coronary vessels, coronary arteries, and they feed the heart uh, with blood, oxygenated blood. However, with occlusions with CAD, or um, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, is an issue with blood flow. And so a lot of times what happens is a person will get a cath, and that cath will go in there and then open up these vessels. And they'll put in what's called a stent. That stent, that X, you see that X like this, and it kind of looks like this. And what it does is, is that this stent will then um, keep the vessel open to allow for blood flow and reperfusion of this, uh, this uh, heart muscle. And so even though we generally for the NCLEX need to know our generics, I say Plavix because it helps me understand that this is a stents and also the, this V right here. This V right here is that you stop this medication five days before every surgery, every surgery, any surgery that they might have, any invasive procedure, it should be stopped. Um, so that's an important note. It's also, you know, very testable. And when we're looking at it, we, like we said, you know, a person is going to have their monitoring of their H&H, uh, &H, you know, and uh, platelets um, regularly. Whenever it's the time is, that's kind of all over the place. But the important piece of that is that um, it is monitored. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the uh, second medication. And that second medication is heparin. So pretty much um, heparin is a, uh, a anticoagulant and um, when we're looking at it, again, we're going to check the hemoglobin and hematocrit. But heparin is an acute med. And the reason it's an acute med um, as far as uh, um, 
cardiac medications, the main reason is that um, you can use an IV. Not only subcutaneous, you can also use an IV. And what it does is it doesn't necessarily uh, break up clots, but it does prevent future clots from happening. So it's very good for patients who have DVTs, or which is deep vein thrombosis, which is basically um, person's legs, and um, they have a clot down there. And that problem with that clot is that clot can migrate, you know, go to the brain, or um, you know, cause problems. And so when there's a clot in the leg or something like that, it could be all other places, but the clot, the leg is the most common. Um, platelets start to aggregate after this. And that could be an acute issue right now. So they get put on a heparin drip. And the reason they do that is to stop this, these clots from forming. There's microembolize behind it. So um, that makes it an acute medication once it's IV. And you're going to monitor the, um, there's the these labs right here. And we talked about this one before, PTT. Sometimes it's called the APTT. Um, and that TT is heparin. So APTT is heparin. Um, now that's different than in practice because, so NCLEX is a little bit different than practice. Uh, they want you to know the APTT is monitored for heparin. However, in the hospital, we uh, monitor hep XA. It's just a lab value. Don't worry about it right now. It's not that important. What I want you to come away with is, is that this PTT is what you want to make sure that you monitor when a patient's on heparin. That's different if they're on subcutaneous heparin. And subcutaneous heparin, like Lovenox or anything like that, anoxaparin, um, which is uh, another one of your medications, anoxaparin. Anoxaparin. So you see this, this suffix right here, parin, right? Hep. Parin. So, parin is a anticoagulant, and um, the highest risk is bleeding. There is an antidote to this that's called protamine sulfate, and that is if they are bleeding, heavily bleeding, uh, we would anticipate protamine sulfate giving them that, and that will reverse that bleeding episode caused by the heparin. Okay, next one is um, aspirin. And uh, people are pretty familiar with it. Uh, that showed up with um, MIs. Remember, we said Hona MB. We said that aspirin is here, right? So, acetic acid, right? So, aspirin is important because it's also an antiplatelet. And, like I said before, with the coronary vessels, if you have an occlusion in that coronary artery over here, you're going to start to get some platelet aggregation. And so we give them four baby aspirins, 81 milligrams, and that will hopefully um, take care of this uh, platelet aggregation so that it doesn't form clots and cause those um, problems. All right, um, also with um, this, there's also the indication of where you take one baby aspirin a day is kind of now that's kind of um it's still in practice um but there is some changes with that um but they recommend that you take one baby aspirin a day uh to prevent any future potential problems that might be going on and that's important to know because of when you have your coronary vessels and you have um inflammation on them or injury um you do start to get some platelet aggregation on these on these vessels and so that baby aspirin um, in these coronary arteries prevents this clots from forming on it. It's just a low dose, but it, uh, it does prevent this potential problem. And that's kind of the thought process behind it. Uh, because not everybody has a full occlusion, right? but they do have injury. And injury is caused by sugars, by hypertension, and all these factors. We're always having some sort of injury in our coronary vessels. All right, so clopidogrel is our first stents. Uh, heparin is acute. Then we have aspirin, which can be acute in the Hona MB for MI. This is hyphalas. This is oxygen, nitroglycerin, uh, aspirin, uh, morphine. 
morphine and beta blockers, all medications. And then um, the next one is NSAIDs. Well, we know it as Motrin or Keralac or Toradol. And Toradol, Keralac is basically Motrin put to, to the fourth power. Um, just super duper Motrin. Okay, uh, NSAIDs are the high risk for this is GI bleeds, right? Um, so they always want, you know, this generally be taken with a full glass of water. Um, and to prevent GI upset, you know, they want you to have some food. Uh, but because it really uh, works on the um, inflammation and uh, the risk is the bleed. Right, so if it's decreasing that inflammation, inflammation is a natural process. But if you're stopping that inflammation, you do get micro clotting going on. But if you're stopping that process, you get bleeding, and um, that's the number one tested uh, item. Next one is a uh, Coumadin, so another bleeding medication. So we already did this one, right? So this was your coags for PT. PTT and INR. And I said before that this is heparin. And then this one is prothromben. And I've said this before thromben is good for coumadin. Okay, so we monitor the PT and the INR. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, but that's generally what we do. And then um, so that diagram is this coag that looks like this, right? And so the antidote for this PT, right, prothromben, good for coumadin, um, is vitamin K. And that uh, is the antidote. Where protamine sulfate um, is the one for heparin. Okay. Then we have our Lexapro or Cetaprolam. We're going to talk about that when we get to uh, to psych, and then uh, the quadruple GI bleed, the quadruple G. We talked about this in the first week. You know, garlic, ginseng, ginkgo, and ginger. You know, those are easy questions. You kind of want that. You know, patient kind of states that they're taking these medicate, these taking these supplements or something like that. And then if they're on any of these medications, you're going to tell them don't do that. Okay, these are the main ones that you're tested on. There are some other ones that are out there, like streptokinase and, you know, agritraban and stuff like that. We'll talk about those later, um, but the priority ones are right here. All right, next slide. And Okay, so don't loop, loop, right, and snag my play Christine Quinn. Okay, so um, what is here? We have things that will cause autotoxicity, which is the um, no hearing, right? And that's important to know because a lot of times the patient will um, will uh, present, you know, with this uh, hearing problem. And uh, one of the ones that show up on here, the only one we're going to talk about is the cardiac meds, which is diuretics, right? Lasix, epikinic acid, diuretics. Now, when we talk about loop diuretics, we're talking about the loop of Henle, and we have the, uh, this is a nephron, and you have a kidney, and inside the kidney, there's tons of nephrons, and so you have the blood flow that comes in here, PD, proximal, proximal PD, and uh, it goes down to the loop of Henle, and then it goes out to distal, and then it goes out to the toilet where the person goes to the bathroom. And that's how we get rid of fluids, right? So blood circulates through here, and then they lose things along the way. They lose sodium, they lose potassium, they lose uh, other electrolytes. Okay, now diuretics do that, and but why is it autotoxic? And the main reason it's autotoxic is up here in the endolymphatic endo sac. This is mainly responsible for the hearing piece because it connects to this cochlea and this cochlea right here is this fluid filled area and this sensory sense senses this cochlea and this allows us for um, interpretation of our hearing and what's going on well this sac specifically gets affected by it so when you have diuretics you're losing sodium and potassium and these are the pieces that are here um, so when you start to lose these, this becomes kind of um, 
uh, uh, kind of squeezed in a sense that it doesn't allow for osmotic shifts, right? Long story, basically you lose your hearing because of it, um, because that diuretic affects all sodium, not just in the kidneys, but up in the brain. And it more specifically on this endolymphatic sac. And that's why we lose our hearing. Uh, but you can, once you stop it, you will get your sodium and potassium back. And next thing you know, the one to three days, the hearing will come back. So just stop the medication if they have that. Next thing is salicylic, salicylic, sal <laughs> aspirin. It's, um, and aspirin's mainly because of the, um, the Preston and the Preston in the uh, in the body is a protein, and the protein is connected where the cochlear is, and you know it's also connected to the hair where you know you have on your head. That's part of the proteins that are there. And there's some interaction with the cochlea that um, this Preston uh, protein gets um, basically here. Where you can see that protein right there. That gets inhibited. And because that's inhibited, um, therefore there's lose, loss of hearing. Again, stop the medication and then returns right back, um, usually one to three days from there. Uh, but you see a bigger problem when there is toxicity, uh, like aspirin overdoses and stuff like that. All right, that's it for the uh, cardiac meds on hearing. Um, next is the meds that are given without food. All right, so meds without food. All right, so this is, you generally don't give the med. Meds are given in the morning, um, not with other meds. And we talked about that earlier. We talked about, um, well, not really, uh, last week with the, um, if you give two medications and you have side effects, which one was it? And so you can't define that one, so therefore you only give one medication. It doesn't mean that medications aren't given together. Um, but certain medications you never get together. All right. Next thing is um, 36, 30 to 60 minutes before meals, no juices. We talked about that. No coffee, water only. All right. So what shows up for um, cardiac? All right. Busy bees are spastic. Okay. So um, nope, not your choline. Nope, pulmonary. Nope, uh, uh, endocrine. GI, GI, antibiotic, sildenafil. Okay, sildenafil, it's a Viagra, okay? Sildenafil fills the penis, right? So, fills the penis, I'm gonna draw it, but um, basically uh, increases the blood flow to the penis to allow for, um, to, to allow for erections and to allow for uh, people who are in the 50s and 60s who have ED. Um, erectile dysfunction disease or condition and you take this medication and then um, you don't have a problem anymore. All right, but the big issue is you take it with without food, right? So you take it without food. Uh, um, uh, you can take it with food, but make sure it's low fat. But what's most testable on this is not so much that you take it without food or low fat. The biggest key that this one shows up on is um, it doesn't play well with nitrates. So nitrates are nitroglycerin, right? So we had something before where we said HONA MB again. Okay, we're in cardiac, so this is for an M MI, nitroglycerin. So if they're on nitro, if they're going to get nitro in an emergent situation, you need to ask this. Because if they're on sildenafil, see, a fill, fill, fill the penis, right? So if they're on this medication, they might want, not want to talk about it, right? So they might be embarrassed by it. They don't want to talk about it. So they show up with an MI. You're not going to give this nitrate. You're going to hold that nitrate if they're on sildenafil, and you're going to question that order. So you never ever give that with sildenafil. And the main reason is um, sildenafil vasodilates. Nitrates vasodilates, right? Opens up the vessels. And if it opens up the vessels, um, and you have two things opening up the vessels, it could be uh, cause problems. And so generally, that's the first question that we ask is that you want any... Uh, uh, erectile dysfunction medications like sildenafil or anything like that. And if it's a yes, 
you hold the nitro. You talk to the doctor, A hap C, right? So A hap C, which is all the reasons how you manage your medication. So A hap C. Somebody tells me uh, I'm going to give nitro. It's going to be acute. Okay. When do I hold it? Well, if they're on sildenafil. What do I assess for? Chest pain. What do I prepare for? Nothing. Do I tell the doctor? Yes. A hap C. All right, the last one is uh, thyroid meds. Nope. Isenazide. Nope. And then captor pill. We said earlier, uh, crapto pill. Crapto pill. And um, leaves a bad taste in, in your mouth. So don't eat it with, uh, with food. Don't have it with food. And it's an ACE inhibitor. And we've talked about ACE inhibitors before, where we said that ACE inhibitors are ACE, King, High, in April. April. Capta Pril. Pril. April. And that's an important medication, right? So it's a chronic medication, right? But there are acute issues. Angioedema, cough, and electrolyte potassium high. And these ACE inhibitors, ACEs, generally only treat blood pressure and not heart rate. Okay, moving on. All right, so these are ones that you take with food. Okay, so no, none of these are cardiac meds. Uh, so none of these are cardiac, no cardiac, no cardiac, no cardiac, no cardiac, no cardiac, statins. Okay, statins with evening meals. Okay, so um, what it is, GI upset. And then uh, general use is uh, bananas, oatmeal, potatoes with a, within 30 minutes. Um, after a full meal, uh, NSAIDs with food or milk. Okay, CR meds, do not crush meds. Anything show up here for cardiac? Yep, uh, so modified release medication specifically. So we said that MR modified release, these can be opened. We didn't talk about all these, we just said you have to memorize them, right? So control release, right, like Ambien, right? So control release, that means it's going to be released later um modified release these can be open so the big key is about do you crush it do you not crush it extended release um and then delayed release and then uh sustained release so the only one right here is that the ones that can be opened and what do you mean you can sprinkle it you can put it on something and you can also uh put it through a tube and those type of things all right so uh what shows up cardiac okay so c's and d's right so uh um Verapamil, right? So Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker. Um, Covetalol, LOL. So um, I'm old, so this is laugh out loud. And um, belly laugh, ha ha ha. <laughs> Funny, right? So uh, belly laugh out loud, um, that's a beta blocker. Okay, then diltiazem, also a calcium channel blocker. So you have verapamil and diltiazem. So calcium channel blockers are called DV equals AV. Okay, diltiazem, verapamil equals AV. AV is the, we talked about this before, SA node, which is in the heart. And we said you learn this in anatomy so the SA node is the pacemaker pace maker pace P P pacemaker of the heart and then Q R S T we said this site's chronic this site's acute and we said that um, well what this verap pamel and DV DV AV SA node to the AV node to the Bakunji fibers. So these are all right. This is how this happens. It's because of this conduction. But this AV is rate. Okay, that's just, that's why I have it there. So DV, uh, AV reminds you that these are rate medications. So heart rate is assessed on these medications. So, and you hold that medication if it's less than 60. That's different than um, ACEs and ACE inhibitors, right? Which it's blood pressure only. All right, moving on. All right, fat iron after after bat, 
All right, without dairy. Okay, so I said this before. These are all not um, cardiac. So we're going to move on. All right, so cardiac, the organ, knowing your organ is the most important, right? So knowing what this really means. So superior vena cava into the right atrium and then through the um, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, out the pulmonary artery, right, to the lungs where the magic happens, and then pulmonary veins uh, into the left atrium, into the mitral valve, and out the aortic valve out to the aorta. This goes brain and then the body and everywhere else. It where it pushes out the oxygen to the other things. So hearts and vessels, that's what we're kind of talking about. That's the main issue. We have mechanisms of CAD to hypertension to CHF, CHF, CHF. So that's major complications of this uh, thing. Other than episodic things, which we'll talk about, assessment of medications, what you need to know, uh, top 100 medications, va variables to medications, and Let's get into it. All right, so some terms that you need to know. Okay, so when we're talking about heart medications, so now we're going to get into the actual unit. Heart medications are affected by either um, perfusion, so that's the pump, okay? If the pump is not working, you have an increase of an overload, more fluid, okay? Or you have a low volume. Low volume gets corrected by the pump, uh, meds, electrical problems, so some some medications will affect electricity. Like we said uh, last week, we said amiodarone or amyslodarone. And we mentioned this rhythm, which is VTAC. So VTAC. And we also said VFib. Right? So both of these are clear, sharp, shock delivered. Right? So that's what that is. Um, so acute, you have to figure out whether it's acute or chronic, and then we'll get into either it's a vessel medication or it's a pump medication. So some things to go over is um, some terms. All right, so alpha, okay, so alpha, alpha away. So it's kind of this symbol. Looks like the fish, right? So alpha, right? So I usually turn this fish like this, right? So it's like this. So V. Okay, and this is vasoconstriction. So alpha is generally out here. All your alpha receptor sites are generally out in the peripheral. And we just said it, vasoconstricts. So alpha agonist agonizes, right, makes this work. So you flip this over, this becomes V, vasoconstriction. So alpha agonists uh, constrict blood and blood flow and push it back to the heart. And therefore, we go to Starling's Law. Starling's Law is the greater the fill, the greater the pump. So if you're squeezing them, vasoconstricting, you're bringing all the fluid back to the heart. Okay, um, that's good for shock states and um, other issues. But generally not for CHF. Because think about that, CHF, congestive heart failure. So this heart is not working. So if I was to squeeze it, put them on an alpha that will squeeze that, would I want to send that blood squeezing, filling up that heart that's already broken? No, I wouldn't want to do that. So I'm not going to want to put alphas on a person that has congestive heart failure. More, more likely, I want to kind of relax these vessels, right? Which we'll talk about with the medications and cardiac. All right, so what else do you need to know here? So that's alpha, that's the first thing. Then you have beta. So beta beats the heart. Okay, so beta, B-E-A-T, beats the heart, okay? So basically what it does is it pumps the heart. So beta agonist, so agonist, pumps the heart, and beta antagonist, doesn't pump the heart, relaxes the heart. So alpha agonist vasoconstricts, alpha antagonist relaxes. All right, so beta beats the heart. So the big thing about beta and, and also alpha is there's uh, alpha one and alpha two. Okay. And we'll talk more about that when we get these. These are mainly acute, so for alpha two. And then we have beta. Now beta one in the heart and then 
beta 2, there's two lobes of the lungs. Beta 2 is in the lungs, okay? So the, the interesting thing is when we're talking about beta agonist or a beta antagonist or beta blocker, right? So cardiac med, beta, right? Belly laugh out loud, LOL. So metoprolol, LOL. You know, labetalol, LOL. So these are beta blockers. They affect the heart, okay? But, you know, we'll talk about it because it, it's a beta blocker, so it's going to decrease the heart rate, okay? But the issue is that it can also affect the lungs. So if somebody has pulmonary conditions like COPD, and they're on a beta blocker, um, they already have problems with the lungs. And so if they, you know, have problems, they have a medication that's also affecting their lungs, it could cause complications. We'll talk about that when we get the beta blockers. All right, moving on. All right, so let's talk about the patho. Okay, so the patho is, we'll come back to this sheet again. And we already talked about cardiac medication. So, and we already did the diagram for MI, but I want to talk about CAD to hypertension to CHF. Okay, so you have CAD. CAD, so you have, a, you know, several things, cardiovascular disease. So the problem might be out here, might be out here, uh, but it also might be in the heart. And then what happens is CAD, you know, can cause um, problems in the sense that you can either, you can get what's called PAD or PVD, okay? Peripheral arterial disease. So the problem is in the arteries out here. And then PVD, peripheral vascular disease, the problem is in the vessels, the veins out here, okay? These patients, are walking patients, okay? Um, and you'll learn that in your first med surge class because it's a chronic condition. It doesn't really mean it's acute. They don't run to the hospital. They don't call the doctor up. They don't, you know, they have issues and they have problems with it, but they're chronic problems. They're not acute problems. But long-term, it can cause problems on the heart. And the reason that is, if you have peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease, think of hypertension in the legs, okay? So there's a severe hypertension in the legs. So as the heart is trying to pump and push out, it's trying to pump through the, the vessels. So it takes more strength of the heart to pump into that, into the peripheral arteries. And... The issue with that is you get modeling in the heart. And what I mean by modeling is the heart gets tired. You might get a hypertrophic heart. Hypertrophic is big trophy hearts, you know, a lot of muscle, but little space inside. Or you get floppy hearts, you know, cardiomyopathy, which is floppy. So think of a baggy heart. Doesn't really have Starling's law of filling and squeezing. So those are the two conditions that you can get with um, the PADs, PVDs, other than complications to, to having it. Um, but we're not getting too much of that patho. And the other one is hypertension. Right? If you have hypertension out here, same thing. It causes modeling, changes in the heart, which you can either get hypertrophic, big trophy hearts, or you can, and just think about the person who's working out, working out, working out, pushing hard, pushing hard, trophy heart, big heart, big muscle, but little space inside. Okay? And that's issue because it can't stretch. The other one is overstretch, cardiomyopathy, floppy heart. Problem is, decreases the, the ability for the heart to pump. All right, so that's the path that right here. So those patients with CAD hypertension will be walking around. They're going to kind of basically sit in the nurse's station. Um, the risk is, um, is mainly uh, CHF-like symptoms. Problems with the heart and cardiac output. Um, generally, they're not here unless it's like late, late stage. They can be on the floors, uh, and sex doesn't really matter. And then um, this generally shows up anywhere in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, okay, next. Next one is PVD to PAD to CHF, which I just talked about. And then the next one is CAD to angina to MI. And we did this allogram, uh, allogram, 
Hmm. We did this diagram. That's it. Diagram. So we did this diagram when we did the first week. We said the MI. What I didn't talk about was a precipitating factor. And a precipitating factor could be like angina. Angina is a pain, chest, chest pain. So, so what's the deal with the angina? So you have your coronary vessels here. You may have atherosclerosis, CAD, right? Atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis. And you may have these things right here. So this is a coronary vessel. What I'm talking about is around the heart. And these vessels are kind of going around the heart. Okay, so as the person is moving, these coronary vessels want to open up. But they can't open up because they're kind of occluded. So what happens is because they can't vasodilate, the tissue down here doesn't get the oxygen it needs and it causes chest pain, which is called angina. Okay, that's the basics of it. All right, so if that lasts any length of time, we try to do HONA MB. High follows, increase the oxygenation to that issue. Might give them oxygen. Nitro, glycerin, we talked about is a nitrate was an anti-anginal. Nitrate vasodilates says, yeah, this is the problem, but we're going to give you a medication that's really going to try to open this up. That's give, generally given um, under the tongue. Uh, then there's aspirin that we talked about earlier, right? These platelets start to form over here, so we stop that from happening. And then morphine. Well, we have this blood flow moving into the heart. That's called your preload. Preload, be the load before the heart. It's the blood flow that's coming into the heart. That's always happening. All right, well, if we know this, the person's having an MI like this, we're going to say, hey, hold, slow down. Slow down. Let's give them some morphine. That's going to help with the pain. But it's also going to help decrease this preload going into the heart. And that's a good thing because less fill, less pump. And when a heart is having a coronary issue, like an MI, we don't want to pump it hard. We want it to chill out, relax, you know, relax, take it easy, right? So, and that's why we'll give them morphine. And then beta blocker, the same thing. Beta, one heart, beta blocker, softens the heart. We don't want it pumping. We want to slow it down, relax, beta blocker relax that heart because it's having an mi and there's a major issue right here so that's coronary vessel disease right to uh angina to mi to now the problem is is that if you have long-term problems pain no oxygen to that heart you're going to have some modeling and it's not going to pump as well and then if it's not pumping there's a pump problem which is a CHF problem, congestive heart failure problem. All right, moving on. Okay, so let's look at the card. And what we're looking at in this card, we're going to specifically look at cardiac. And um, cardiac in a sense, okay, so acute versus chronic, right? So if it is an acute medication, it's going to be filled out here. That will make it acute. And we already said before, like amiodarone, amiodarone, is an acute medication okay because why it's given for this that's VTAC right amisloterone and it's also given for VFED and this is all clear right medications right so it's given for the heart and um, but let's keep going so then we're looking at this for cardiac let's look at what we need to look at oh um, heart is here some medications do affect the lungs, like beta blockers. Right? Um, some medications do affect the kidneys. Uh, vessels are definitely affected because of PAD, PVD. Um, blood, we talked about as well, like your anticoagulants, like Plavix, those type of things. Uh, GI upset, not necessarily. Uh, this is not necessarily. Blood is not. Bones not. This not. This not. So mainly you're looking at with cardiac, you're looking at these right here kidneys and um, vessels and blood. 
So if you're circling anything in the cardiac things, it's going to be in that general area. And that's just something to think about. Unless we're talking about like um, uh, cholesterol medications. Cholesterol medications are always the same. It's always liver, right? So your liver enzymes, and it's always going to be your pancreas and gallbladder. You know, because that's all what cholesterol kind of fills and, and gets made and gets processed. All right, so let's talk about cardiac medications. All right, so blood pressure. Blood pressure is important to monitor for your medications. And we already said that, you know, prills, right? So asapril, right? In April, you know, your ACE inhibitors, uh, these are blood pressure meds. So you monitor blood pressure. These are not heart rate medications. So, um, when we get into the different ones, we're going to talk about, you know, asapril, we're going to talk about ARBs and all these type of things. So orthostatics, what is orthostatics? Orthostatics are taking your blood pressures, you know, um, you know, you have the patient who's lying, they sit up, you take your blood pressure, and then you have them stand and you take their blood pressure. And if you see variances in either things, whether it's in the blood pressure, the systolic, the diastolic, or the uh, heart rate, and that's 2020 10 2020 10 these are variations in each of these areas if you see variations um then they're orthostatic some things are expected and some things are not expected some medications cause orthostatics um all first dose cardiac meds you just need to know you just don't take this medication and start riding a bike or you start doing a marathon you know, because your body has to regulate to taking this medications. So just to be aware of that, um, what orthostatics are, that's different than orthostatics because they're dehydrated. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we get to infection. All right, so uh, risk is orthostatic. You're going to see this showing up a lot with cardiac medication. So heart sounds. So heart sounds are pretty um, what they are. And... And what we're doing is, why would we need to monitor heart sounds? Well, first thing is, um, you have meds, right? We already said that calcium channel blockers, CA blockers, right? And uh, beta blockers. So we have acute meds up here, A, B, C, C, D. Calcium glycosides, I'm adding some new content here and diuretics we're going to cover this stuff again so don't worry about it right now but what i'm doing is i'm showing you kind of why um, we will check the apical heart rate and these top two well, actually these three are all apicals you monitor heart rate with these and diuretics and uh ace inhibitors and stuff like that is all blood pressure so you hold hold that uh meds with calcium channel blockers and then uh, calcium glycosides and beta blockers less than 60 on a heart rate uh we'll talk more about that when we get to the classes and then uh everything else ace inhibitors are generally blood pressure all right so then we have some medications are with monitor like we said amiodarone that's going to be dependent it's going to affect the ecg you're going to see vtac vfib and then um s3 is heart failure um, that's an extra heart sound. We have S1 and we have S2. So you learn LUB and then you're going to learn DUB. Okay. So LUB DUB. Those are the valves closing. Okay. And that's what you're listening for, right? So those are the valves closing. Um, if they're not closing correctly because of, we said, cardiomyopathy or um, uh, hypertrophic hearts, you get an extra heart sound. Okay, so you have S3, S4, that just means extra heart sound. That's code for extra heart sounds. S3, S4 is code for CHF. Okay. They're always acute. Um, next thing is a BNP. Don't worry about that right now. Um, oh. BNP is a, um, I said, don't worry about him talking about it. <laughs> PNP is CHF. Okay, it's just a lab test for CHF. Lung sounds, some medications, we already said that, right? So we said beta blockers, right? So we said beta blockers are beta 1, 
one heart, two lungs. Okay. So I made a two. Okay. So so you might assess lung sounds. You might get wheezes with beta blockers. So it's important to look at that. It's also to question asthma. No O2 stuff, no ABG stuff. No real kidney stuff unless it's said. But um, statins and stuff like that, they show up with gallbladder and stuff like that. Uh, bleeding meds do show up because of, we already said, we said that anticoagulants are going to affect bleeding. Manicure platelets, cholesterol, we're going to be monitoring, we're going to get into. And electrolytes, we already, we already found out that ACEs causes high potassium. Okay, Magnesium also shows up with cardiac. We'll talk about that later. And then we said some meds are out of toxic, some meds are with food, uh, no real bladder, no little... Actually, with eyes, there are some medications like beta blockers are actually uh, drips, uh, eye drops, and it decreases ocular pressure. And that's important to know because um, some medications are cardiac meds, but you're putting them in your eye. Um, some meds with dairy and uh, those and some with uh, no food. All right. All right, so let's get into what we just kind of talked about. So medication classes. All right, so we have acute meds up here. We'll talk about those as we go through them. We just talked about beta blockers. We have calcium channel blockers, CA blockers. Okay, so calcium channel blockers are DV, AV, diltiazem, verapamil. Those are the only two. Uh, so DV, AV, okay, so AV, you take your AV, that's the rate. So you assess heart rate for these medications and view the pines, like pine trees, pines. So pines, pines, P. So let's take a med. M, low, the pine. It's a calcium channel blocker, okay? So pines. That's not diltiazem, that's right on the peripheral. That's on the peripheral. P, peripheral. Pines, peripheral. All right, and I talked about peripheral already. And what does that mean? Peripheral. We went back to this heart, and then we said that there's um, alpha out here. We have the lungs out here, the alpha out here. Then this is beta. So peripheral, the amlodipine, is a calcium pine. Peripheral. It affects it out here, not necessarily alphas, but it basically think of this. Calcium is hard, right? Um, calcium blockers makes vessels softer, makes them more compliant, less tense. Therefore, if these are less tense out here, you're going to have decreased blood pressure. Okay? And that's kind of why amlodipine works, right? Um, because it works on the vessels and it works to soften them. Where DV, diltiazem, and verapamil work specifically on the calcium channels in the heart. Because calcium channels are basically everywhere on this. You know, you have, you've learned this in your A and P. You have calcium channels on the cell. That's it. You know, and if you're blocking it, they're not working as well. Okay, calcium channels. So therefore, they're not as hard. And then, um, so on here, on the heart, diltiazem affects calcium channels on the heart. The rapamil affects calcium channels. So by blocking these calcium channels, you're going to decrease the conduction. DV, AV is conduction. So it's going to decrease that conduction. So therefore, you're going to decrease the heart rate. And therefore, we assess apical with Diltiazem and verapamil. In load of pines, right? Pines are peripheral. You assess blood pressure and sometimes heart rate, but most likely it's blood pressure with that one. All right, so calcium channel blockers, calcium glycosides like digoxin, and then um, we'll talk about that later. Diuretics, diuretics affect the fluid problem. So if there's an overload problem, like CHF is overload, that's why they need diuretics. And in here, I talk about ACEs and ACE inhibitors and ARPs. And those are specifically for, um, what's it called? They're for um, fluid, 
related. And we'll talk about that as we get into it. And then statins, uh, cholesterol medications. All right. So here we go. So let's go into it. So thrombolytics are first. Okay, so where do they fit in here? Well, they're acute, right? They're acute because, because they're bleeding, right? So let's kind of go through acute management of ST segment elevations. So thrombolytics, we saw that, right, with um, management of pulmonary embolisms and acute chemo stroke, okay? Pulmonary embolism, there's a clot. There's a clot in the vessel, and so there's a problem. So you need a thrombolytic to break up that clot. Converts plasminogen to plasma, degrades fibrin in the clots. So we said that heparin moves from fibrin to fibrinogen as a clot. Okay, that's a clot, fibrinogen. Okay? So this is a clot formation. Heparin stops this clot formation. It doesn't break down clots. It just stops new clots from forming. So these degrade fibrin in clots. This actually breaks down clots. So thrombolytics are acute. Person's having a stroke. Person's having an MI. We put them on thrombolytics to break up those clots. And then we put them on heparin to prevent future clots from happening. All right, so hypersensitivity okay, hypersent to actor, active internal bleeding, which makes sense. History of CVA accident. So these are contraindications, okay? So we don't give it, and this is going on, okay? So you don't give a thrombolytic to a patient that's bleeding. No kidding, right? So uh, if they had a history of CVA, right, that means they had a potential stroke. So they might have been bleeding in the past, okay? Recent trauma or surgery, right? So if they've been caught up in all those things. You're not going to give them a medication, a thrombolytic lysis. It's going to break up clots. So generally always hold this medication. If they're going for um, surgery, you don't give it to them if they have a history of these things. Um, if they have severe uncontrolled hypertension. So if you have a person that's coming in with hypertensive crisis and their brain is like just banging because their blood pressure is, you know, 240 on 140, so high. Well, the risk is pop. And if you have them on a thrombolytic and they pop, they're just going to keep on bleeding. So you control the blood pressure first, then you give a thrombolytic. Okay, so precautions, recent major surgery, trauma, GI bleeding, all makes sense, hepatic, Renal disease, acute bacterial endocarditis, pericarditis, use course are always in okay, pregnancy. Concurrent use of antiplatelets. Okay, so again, you don't do give medications that are together, right? So if you have an antiplatelet they're on, it's affecting the platelets, platelets are for clotting. So if they're on an antiplatelet and then you're giving them a thrombolytic, you get two things that are gonna cause bleeding. So therefore, which one is the problem? And that's why we are concerned with that. And then we have, um, uh, what else we got? Uh, within 10 days of these things, uh, geriatric, okay, concurrent use, NSAIDs, right? That's a bleeding med. Warfarin, Coumadin, bleeding med. Again, any of these meds, PT, thrombin, Coumadin, PTT, heparin, okay? Um, or heparins may increase risk of bleeding, bleeding. Okay, risk of bleeding may be increased concurrent use of cefotin, cefoparazone, and valproic acid. Most likely is valproic acid. Okay, um, the main reason it's the most common to uh, to uh, be prescribed. It's a uh, seizure medication, and you need to know it because it's um, the risk is. Uh, Bleeding. Now, cephal, this is interesting because cephaloproxone has actually been discontinued. I don't even do that anymore. Um, so it's interesting when you're looking at these drug guides, they get outdated all the time. So which means it's very difficult for the NCLEX to test on certain things. So the, the issue of what NCLEX will test you on, most likely on a thrombolytic, is this stuff. Bleeding, bleeding, and history of potential bleeding. 
that's what they test on not necessarily the other medication so that's nuts to know so don't get into too much of that all right so begin therapy as soon as possible monitor vital signs no kidding why because of blood pressures because of bleeding um do not use lower extremities to monitor blood pressure because of greater risk of injury assess the patient carefully bleeding every 15 minutes no kidding um and then check the body officers internal bleeding uh, so hematuria the same other stuff h and h hematuria black stools all those type of things the black tarry stools hematuria joint pain not most likely if uncontrolled bleeding occurs stop medication or no immediately no kidding ahab say says neural status so coronary thrombosis monitor ecg continuously no kidding um notify physician antiarrhythmias iv lidocaine procainamide may be ordered prophylactically not important cardiac enzymes should be monitored coronary angiography may be ordered okay good to know not need to know monitor heart sounds so we saw those before right s3 sound s3 so we'll talk about that real quick we'll add that on to this s3 equals p e and that makes sense when you're given a thrombolytic and you're monitoring it because of risk for clots and lysis with clots so for pulmonary embolism monitor pulse hemodynamics respiratory status rate and then for arterial occlusions mon monitor ability after blood patency ensure the patient exhales holds breath when disconnecting that's what everybody would know all right, so let's talk about ischemic stroke. That's why you get thrombolytics, right? Because there's a clot in the brain and you want to break that clot up. That's why the four hour window is most important for CVA, cerebral vascular accident strokes, get them to the hospital. And that's why you see three to four hours of onset within three hours, patients with 80 years old, anticoagulants, baseline, a stroke scale score. All right, lab tests. All right, so we have uh, hematocrit, right? So we have a hemoglobin. Yep, we have the platelets, right? We have a fibrin degradation. Don't worry about that. Fibrin concentration, a PT time, right? So then we have this one too. The old labs that you need to know, PTT, and then um, activated part, okay? Activated partial pivot thrombus, APTT. And then um, bleeding times may assess, obtain that. Toxicity. If bleeding occurs, apply pressure to the site. Good to know. Ahapsy. So let's go into that. Ahapsy. So let's take a bleeding patient on a thrombolytic. It's acute. Anything to hold. Yes. Hold that med. Anything to assess for. They're bleeding. Right? Anything to prepare for? Yeah. Hold pressure on med, on site. And call, notify doctor. All right. So, um, bleeding time where it says, okay, okay, Texas, you know, bleeding occurs, internal bleeding, discontinue, clotting factors, maybe restore through whole blood. Okay, prepare blood. Fresh frozen plasma, do not administer a dextran, okay, not really anymore. Uh, antiplatelet activity may be used in adult. Okay, so diagnosis, okay, whatever. And then um, implementation. This medication should be used only in settings of hematological function. Adequately monitored, yep, no kidding. Two IVs, okay. So two IVs, let's talk quickly about this, right? So you're gonna see this, uh, this is normal practice, but you're not gonna see it in the hospital, and that's very interesting. Now, the reason why you have two IVs, right? What if you had an infiltration in this site and they're on a thrombolytic and you need to get blood? Well, you can't do this site because it's dead. So that's why you want two IVs. So you want two IVs in case you need to get bloods or you need to give an antidote. Okay, so always two IVs. But in practice, you're not going to see it, which is strange. Um, and I'm not sure really why, you know, um, they don't. Uh, I mean, you're in charge of your own practice. Okay, so then we have um, sorry, two IVs, one for thrombolytic. Okay, so avoid invasive procedures such as IMs, arterial punctures, 
it could be the clotting, avoid vena punctures um, uh, for at least 30 minutes. Uh, systematic control heparin, so, uh, okay, Tylenol to control fever. All right, so patient explain the purpose of the medications, explain bed rest, minimal handling. Yeah, this patient's not going to be walking around with a thrombolytic. They stay in bed. And then uh, the whole key is to break up that clot, thrombolytic lysis, that clot. All right, so this is our first break of this uh, lecture, and we're going to come back and finish up with the hypertensions and the rest of the medications.